Admiral, come up. A oh, million right. Me have two sticks of dynamite. Admiral, come up. I mean, let me all use dip. I'm going to unbox you to your dip. Man, I love that song. You know, I don't like playing dance hall and out of morning. Because then I just play dance hall for the whole show. But I, I wanted to wake y'all up this morning. Because it's not easy this morning. It's not going to be easy. All right? It's not going to be easy this morning. Because I'm getting into some areas, some sensitive areas. You know, and it was raining this morning in the city of Chirac, state of Drill, Illinois, in America, ka, ka. it's not going to be easy. But I, 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 I'm going to keep quoting the late, great Dr. Khalid Abdul Muhammad. I won't be long, but I must be strong. Okay. Like I said, I try to wake y'all up with some silver cut to follow me out. Wanna cock a one eye in, but they end up with me in a problem. I had to start you off with that. A little shaggy. Big up, big up, and I up, boom, boom, shots. And then I had to go, you know, some 90s dance hard. What? Okay. Come again, selector. You gotta wake you up. Wake up. I have to go to work now. All right, so we started off with some reggae classics. You know. I could just switch the bro dialogue up. Forget political talk, political analysis, radical revolutionary rhetoric. Forget all that. We just need to switch to a dance hall, 90s dance hall, Steer Shan, Baratan, Libby, Katirankin, Dirtsman, Tiger. The lion is no longer the king of the jungle, Tiger. You know, anyway, let me get back to myself. I spent too many years roaming around Brooklyn. So I blame myself. But my years roaming around Brooklyn will be relevant to today's show. Also, uh, shout out to Dr. Obari Cartman. You know, a few weeks ago, August 18th, exactly, almost a month ago, he invited me uh, to a panel discussion to sit at a table across from scholars, some scholars that I know and respect, and some activists. And you know, Obari, he's one of those spiritual brothers. So, you know, he had to have two brothers and two sisters. Had to, my aunt, balance it out. Freaking hippie. I'm sorry, Dr. Obari, but yeah, he's a hippie. But anyway, Dr. Obari and Carmi invited me out for a panel discussion that he wanted to have a discussion uh, on raising black boys um, as a prelude to um, the 2019-2020 the Chicago school year. So he had a lot of parents came out, a lot of parents of daughters as well. Some brothers brought their daughters, and uh, he basically got four activists slash scholars or activists and or scholars who all were raising children of various age. I think uh, the one sister, who, this one scholar, she had the oldest son who was in his late 20s, early 30s. And then one sister had new babies, little babies. She was an activist and an a entrepreneur in the community. And then me and the other brother, we were somewhere in between that. We had, you know, adolescents and teens. So I want to share that on the air to, again, you know, I was most honored to be called out. You know, whenever Dr. Obari calls me out, I'm honored to, to, uh, to answer the call, whatever that may be. So anyway, um, I'm going to be sharing that later in the show. So that's why I want to get through today's topic, which is cults, the scourge of the conscious community. Before I go into that, I want you all to pay attention to a New York Times article that that uh, talked about Uber's fight with the state of California. The state of California has basically stated that you're not going to be treating these uh, employees as contract independent contractors anymore. So the state of Florida and the Democratic hippie legislator in, in California decided that they passed a new law that you couldn't have uh, classified employees as contract workers. You had to bring them on the payroll, pay uh, payroll taxes, pay Social Security fees, health care, even retirement benefits. You had to bring these people on. And Uber said, hell to the no. Hell no. These people are independent contractors, do what they want, and we're not going to allow the government to come to government to come in and regulate our business. Which is ironic because companies like Uber and Lyft and these other gig economy companies could not exist without government regulation. It was government regulations that allowed them to legally operate. 
Because I remember in the day, again, going back to New York in the 90s, two foul on my yard. I remember I used to ride the dollar vans up and down Flatbush. I was taking classes at Brooklyn College and at SUNY Downstate. And I went to work at a, a Downstate Hospital in Kings County Hospital after I graduated. So I was the dollar van, gypsy cab king. And them dollar and, and, and them dollar vans would zoom up and down the street and they'd be on the walkie talkie, blue and white, blue and white, on Bergen, blue and white. That's what they call the police in the dollar van legal. Blue and white upon Bergen. And they were the gig economy. These were independent contractors. And you get on the van and they run the whole strip. And you give a dollar to the driver, or if some drivers had helpers, they pull up, boom, boom, boom. I used to get all over Brooklyn. And then if it was too late or you weren't just going on the main strip, I get the gypsy cab, $5, take me from Sterling and Eastern Parkway all the way to Downstate, all the way to Classen Avenue, $5. And they were doing that and the police were constantly harassing and hounding and impounding their vehicles and incarcerating and even deporting some of those brothers, mostly West Indian, Jamaican, Guineaman, Triniman, Bijan, all them cats who came to America and did this brilliant enterprising service to the community. The enterprising, brilliant service, and they were criminals. And Giuliani, Mayor Giuliani, would come out and have an entire task force, men dressed up in damn near SWAT gear, SWAT teams, to set up traps. And it often creating dangerous situations because these brothers are trying to make a living, feed their families without exploitation, entrepreneurialism. And there were laws from New York City to Cali and everywhere in between laws against this. And they said, it's not safe. You have to get a, a medallion. You have to have a special license. You can't just use your personal vehicle, your personal means of conveyance to drive around people for money. That is against the law. And here these crackers come in the internet age. The only difference now, you used to have to walk out in the street, whistle, snap your finger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And at that time, you have to also know, this is the 80s, late 80s, early 90s. With the gypsy cabs and the dollar van, the yellow cabs, a yellow cab driver could make $150,000 to $200,000 a year in New York City. And they had this attitude that they did not want to pick up black men. And there would be stories in the newspaper all the time. Some prominent uppity hoity-toity Negro, some scholarly Negro, some, uh, some established Negro, some wealthy Negro would come to New York or bring his family to New York or some black diplomat or some African dignitary would come to New York City. And while he's in New York conducting big businesses, doing big things, being a big head nigga in charge, he'd want, well, I'd like to go to Madison Square Garden or I'd like to see the wonderful pond at Central Park or see the Statue of Liberty or the World Trade Center before Bush knocked down the towers. It was you, Cracker. Tell the truth, crap. But anyway, black, these prominent puffy chest black men would come to New York and try to hell a cab. Oh, taxi, good sir. And those racist ass taxi drivers would zoom right past you. And they didn't pick up black men. And they were constantly lawsuits and literally fights in the streets because the black men would see this affront to their dignity and want to jump in front of the cab and the cab damn near running black folks over. And they fancy floor shine shoes and they Taylor Bush Brooks Brothers suits and they Louis Vuitton briefcases. I'm a good Negro. I'm a, a Beta Phi Kappa Negro. I'm a Harvard Negro. I'm a money Negro. And the cabs, I can't catch a cab in Harlem. And to the point where Dr. John Henry Clark said that those racist cab drivers are better Pan-Africans than any of you radical black folks. Because basically Pan-Africanism is to see all African people as one. And those racist cab drivers don't care if you are a lettered Negro or a basic street thug or anything in between because they see you all the same and they ain't picking up none of you niggas. Now, oh, oh, oh calm down. Dr. Clark said, I didn't say it, take it up with the ancestors. Some of y'all believe y'all can speak to the ancestors. 
So go ahead and 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 and, and not only that y'all speak to the because yeah, I can speak to the ancestors, but y'all believe they speak back. So take it up with him. That's what he said. So it was black immigrants from the Caribbean and the continent of Africa who started this gig economy, Uber, Lyft, and all these ride, quote unquote, ride share services. Just like the weed hustle. Everybody realizes that with the weed hustle. Oh, black men sell weed to go to jail. Now white men selling weed and it's a dignified uh, career. They did the same thing. That's why I've never sat in an Uber or, or a damn or a damn Lyft. I don't use the ride share service because I just have a, 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 a it burns, as my older sister says, it burns my soul. It burns my soul. For all them years, I'm hunched down in the back of a gypsy cab or sit, trying to sit close to the door as possible on a dollar van thinking I might have to pop out and run because of the damn NYPD hounding black people just trying to get about their lives. And you got the nerve to tell black men, we can't ride gypsy cabs. We can't ride, uh, we can't ride uh, dollar vans because for our own safety, when y'all the ones making it unsafe by chasing these men up and down the street, when they were just trying to make some money to feed their daughters, as Biggie Smalls would say, call the police on people. And I, I'm not telling you one time I had this sister. I'm a good friend, a good friend of mine. I don't know. I'm a friend of hers. I don't know if she's a friend of mine anymore. Give me a holler. Jenny, Jenny. I have my own Jenny, Jennifer. We went to Madison Square Garden to see KRS-One and, and, and MC Shan battle. It was, it, was a, it was an old school battle showdown. And it was Roxanne Shante versus UTFO. All the classic beefs. Madison Square Garden. It was the greatest kind. She used to work for the Source magazine. And she got some tickets. And it was a night on the town. As friends. As friends. But it was uh, one of the, the greatest hip hop experiences of my life. Karis one got on that stage and ripped it. The bridge is over. And it was about 2 to 3 in the morning. And we walk out of Madison get, uh, uh, Square Garden and we was hype. And this young lady, her mother was a lawyer. She was a straight A student. Even now, she's running a very, very, very successful business. This was a together sister, a black girl magic, black excellence, her whole family. Her brother's an accomplished author and artist. And we walk out to see me. I'm just, a, you know, around the way dude. You know, I didn't have no accolades, but hey. I was with good people. And we walk out of Madison Square Garden in Midtown Manhattan and we headed back to Brooklyn. And you know, we couldn't get a cab. And this young lady kept trying to hail a cab and a car service. And this is kind of sister, she could afford a limo service if she wanted. She figured after the concert, we skip right back to Brooklyn, grab a bite to eat and go home. And this sister, this young black woman, ambitious, bright young black woman, literally collapsed in my arms. She was so hurt that these cabs kept zooming by us. We'd walk up on one cab and it had the light. They used to have the lights on to indicate whether they were on or off duty. So when they see you coming, they click on the light and click on the off duty light and then zoom off. It was crazy. Now it was, that was my first time because I, before I moved to New York, I'm like, I'm not catching no damn cabs. Screw the cabs. Every cab driver in New York City will starve. If it's up to me, because I ain't about to fight nobody to take my money. I wouldn't have been sitting at them lunch counters to eat them bland white folks food. I wouldn't have been on white folks nothing. I don't, hey, you don't want my money? Just like I don't go into these Korean beauty supply shops. I don't go into no racist folks businesses. It, but if you're going to be racist, don't let me catch it. Don't let me, I better not catch it. Because I'm done. I don't play. I don't ask you nothing. I don't expect nothing from you. I just leave you the hell alone. Go my own way. For now. But anyway, this young lady collapsed and cried into my arms. And I said, listen, it's getting really late. The sun about to come up. We just going to have to get on the subway. And don't worry, I ride the subway two, three, four in the morning all the time. Ain't nobody going to mess with us. I got me this here knife. We'll be all right. And she's like, I'm not getting on the subway at three, four, five, six in the morning. You crazy. So then a gypsy cab. A ride share pulled up, an illegal cab, and she got her composure. And she was like, oh, mm -mm. Um, wiped her tears away after being zoomed off on like half a dozen yellow cabs and limousine services. And the cab pulls up. She gets her composure, cleans herself up and said, no, no, I'm not getting in a gypsy cab. No, 
And I said, look at here, sister. We either getting in this cab or getting on the train or I'm going to go against all my values and principles and leave your ass standing on this empty street corner in the middle of Manhattan at 3 in the morning. Make your decision. You got three options. So we finally got in the gypsy cab, ride share, Pr proto Uber, proto Lyft. And he took us home. And I have to this day, I lived in New York City for over a decade and I never ever once hailed a road in one of them yellow cabs. And then they got stories right now because of Uber and Lyft, the cab drivers are killing themselves on city hall steps. They got cab driver suicide. And I'm trying to work up this tear duct because it's all dry. I'm trying to moisturize and massage this tear duct because I ain't got no tears for them racist ass cab drivers. I ain't got no love for Uber and Lyft. But I ain't got no tears for the cab drivers either. Bastards on both sides. Bastards all around. But who I do got tears and sympathy for is all them brothers who paid fines and had their cars confiscated for all them years in New York City doing the same thing that you call when white boys do it. They're brilliant. They're entrepreneurs. They're billionaires. So anyway, but anyway, I didn't even intend to go all off into that. But this is a major labor struggle. This is not just for the gig economy. This is about the future of labor. And if you know anything about the American labor struggle, the United States had the most violent and bloody labor struggle in the world of the post-industrial and early industrial era. Let me tell you something about labor. If you don't make money from your dividends, if you work for a wage or if you are on any kind of payroll, if you are not a multimillionaire over three generations, let me tell you something. You proletariat, allow me to inform you of this. Your your comfort, the three day, the 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 seven, the five day work week, the eight hour work day, overtime, uh, job on site safety, uh, work, uh, social security, everything that you have that you enjoy, benefits of being an American, everything that you appreciate about being working class in America, you got in spite of capitalism, not because of capitalism. Everything that the working class has that they enjoy, they got in spite of capitalism. The capitalists fought everything. The fact that your children get to get up and take their little crusty nose behinds to school instead of to go work in a mill, instead of go work in a coal mine, instead of go work in a textile factory, that is not because of capitalism. The capitalism fought to maintain child slavery wage slavery, starvation wages, sweatshops, the, the socialists, the communists, the anarchists are what brought about the middle class, not capitalism. You dumbasses, go study actual history. And we're losing all of this because the capitalists who control the media and the educational system are now telling you the reason you're a good, your, your working good life is so good is because of capitalism and because you personally are so brilliant. It's got nothing to do with collective struggle, socialism, communism, radicalism, anarchism, class analysis, and class warfare. None of that stuff. Forget all that. Just do you, player. Go for self, and you too can be a Jay-Z and a Beyonce one day. Y'all some suckers. Y'all you're playing yourself. This is an interesting article. I would pay attention to this California Uber conflict. It's still working its way through the courts. It's still working its way, but it's not getting enough public attention. This is the future of the um, Western and modern, uh, um, what they call the information age labor struggle. Pay close attention, because this, as go California, so goes the nation. Just think about what California has done for you in your life, like emission standards. California, when they were fighting against smog in the 80s, they had some of the highest emission standards. And if California has your little redneck backwoods, you live in Mississippi, you live in Missouri and Kansas and Oklahoma with those right wing uh, red uh, state legislatures, they would have you sucking lead gas out of, out of car exhaust pipes. It was because of California that the few environmental regulations that we had that benefit and extend our lives are there now. So as goes California, so goes the nation. So pay attention, especially to labor conflicts coming out of California. This is a very important story. And of course, if you stay tuned into the Bro Diallo Show, I'll keep y'all updated on that struggle. I also want to talk about the uh, Bahama body count. They're, they uh, say that, there are, that the death toll is officially 50, 
but there are over 2,500 missing persons who haven't been accounted for, but they can't say that they're dead because they have not located their corpses, nor have they located their living bodies, but it is a very much likelihood that the death toll is going to go well beyond 50 and even well beyond the 2,500 missing people, uh, unconfirmed, dead or alive. And, you know, this is really tragic because uh, Donald Trump is uh, denying these, these people um, entry into the uh, country and protect the status, which is pretty much par for the course. And let me tell you something about the Bahamas. The Bahamas is not a country. The Bahamas is not a nation. The Bahamas is a protectorate. It is a colony of the United States, just as all of the Caribbean is. The United States is responsible for the Caribbean. The United States directly dictates Caribbean politics and directly funds and arms Caribbean militaries. And Caribbean armed forces do not fight for the protection of the nation. They fight for the suppression of their population. And I didn't mean for that to rhyme. I'm not trying to Jesse Jackson, y'all. It just came out that way. But understand colonialism. Even Colin Powell said, if you break it, you bought it. The reason why uh, Cuba has some of the most comprehensive uh, hurricane preparedness. And even with Hurricane Katrina, Cuba had a fraction of the uh, losses. You know, whenever there's a major storm, Cuba has losses in the single digits or the teens, while the surrounding countries have losses in the hundreds and thousands, including the United States. And that's because Cuba is a socialist country, and they're able to independently set up their own infrastructure priorities and their own uh, economic priorities, and they can invest in protecting their people as opposed to invest in paying off their, their debt holders and debt peonage. And the reason Bahama was not in a position to defend itself, to protect its citizens, because it's, it's also under neo-colonial debt peonage. So the United States is responsible for those lives. Because you have American citizens, but then you also have American colonial subjects, like Iraqis, like Palestinians, people who are under the colonialism of the United States. The United States is responsible for them. And I know y'all like to act mad, especially you ignorant black people who talk about people coming into this country, taking our jobs. Let me tell you something. You don't respect the borders of an empire because America doesn't respect anybody's borders. So how are you weeping about people violating America's territorial integrity when America respects no other nation's territorial integrity? Honduras should be able to have dual citizenship, should be able to come here and vote in America. I think everybody in the world should be able to vote in America's elections until the United States stops being a damn bloodthirsty uh, uh, parasitic empire. But we already talked about that. All I want to say is find a reputable charity. Find some expats from the Bahamas and see how you can help these people. And another thing you say, anything you see America doing to black people abroad, believe you me, they won't hesitate to do to us. Don't think your little social security card and your little American citizenship is going to protect you from this racist, genocidal nation. Because every time they got a notion to do it, they inflict on us the same atrocities they inflict on the Haitians. They inflict on the Congolese, and now they're inflicting on the Bahamas. Remember, the Bahamas, Trump said, go back to the Bahamas and die. But remember what they said when, the, when our brothers and sisters were trying to get out of uh, the wards in, in Louisiana. They said, go back to your townships and drown and die. You're not leaving this area. Go to the Superdome. So don't think we're exempt. We have more in common to be unified with African people across the globe than we do these white oppressors, these capitalists in our own countries who have the same uh, uh, citizenship as we do. You better wake the blood clot up. And everything you see Trump talking about and, and talking about doing bomb, bombing people to the Stone Age, they'll bomb our communities just the same. Don't think you're exempt. There is no exemption for you because you got a social security card because you have an American citizenship. That don't mean a damn thing to this racist, insane, genocidal nation. Now, I don't want to get too far into this before we go into the actual topic. Because when I talk about today cults, I got a personal ter testimony. I'm going to testify today. Glory! I'm going to testify because I have a very, very, very personal stake in this. But there's a, a gentleman, in the, when I first moved to New York, a lot of getting, getting personal today. Um, I came here ready to hit the ground running. 
and I wanted to get active. I know that Chicago is legendary for black radical politics, black progressivism, black radicalism. So when I moved here almost a decade ago, I'm like, yeah, let's do it. So one of the people I actually connected with uh, was Dr. Leon Finney. Because I was told Leon Finney got more, controls more land on the south side of Chicago than almost any other individual. He has over 200 empty plots, not even counting his properties, but over 200 empty plots. So I said, you know, give me one of them empty plots of land so I could start an urban farm. And so he took me to this one site that was an uh, old canning factory that was torn down. And it was about three acres, which in the city. Now, if you're from the country, I know y'all listening in Missouri. What up, Rip T? I know my people listening in Missouri. I say three acres, y'all roll your eyes. That, that ain't no land. This ain't Missouri. This ain't Kansas. I'm talking about the middle of a metropolis. You know, this is like New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, Houston, the biggest cities in this country. Three acres of open land is a miracle from baby Jesus. They, I, I, so I'm talking to my city people here. I'm not talking to y'all country people. Y'all don't, y'all don't, y'all don't, y'all understanding of land is different than us. You know, you, somebody got a little garden box on their porch. They think they are, are plantation owners. It's, you know, we don't, land is scarce here, un, undeveloped land. But anyway, it was an old canning factory, but I had some concerns. But I was like, if this was a canning factory, you know, back in the day, they used to use a lot of toxic chemicals to, as preservatives and to lime the can. So even though this was an old canning factory, I'm like, is this a super fun site? I'm like, to, to what extent is this land cleaned up? Or can we at least have the soil and the grounds tested for, you know, lead, mercury, and all the other contaminants that might come from a former manufacturing site on the south side of Chicago? And this is like in the 80s, no, 79, 80th. But he didn't want to do the, do, do the site check. He was like, just get out here and grow some food. And I'm like, I can't get out here and grow some food and give it to people that I don't know is not contaminated. I can't grow on contaminated soil. And I'm like, if you want to do above ground on three acres, that's, that's tens of thousands of dollars just to get started. All the soil, you know, all the remediation. So anyway, needless to say, the negotiations broke down. And, you know, but Finney and I had a few conversations. I told him about my plan for, for ecologic outreach, trying to, to get the hood to go green, to adopt vegan dieting and adopt sustainable practices and begin to uh, set up the hood for renewables, renewable energy and independent energy production. I laid it all out and Finney was like, wow, you know, I didn't know about stuff because Finney's an old guy. He's like, I didn't know about all that. So, uh, anyway, I'm sorry. I got this, this, uh, this dumbass black Trump supporter on my feed. I'm gonna have to block him. I known this guy for so long. Shame on him dumbass black but I can't do more than one thing let me talk to y'all let me not look at this stupid idiot black Trump Trump supporter Woo. anyway I wasn't talking about Dr. Finney anyway our negotiations broke down because Finney he was one of those guys which is a weird he wanted to make money but he also I think he wanted to do good I don't know I didn't know the guy but anyway our negotiations broke down and he said, well, in the future, if you come up with some projects or you want to do some things, uh, give me a shout. So anyway, I hadn't spoke to Finney or interacted with Finney in years. And then I saw an uh, article saying the fall of Dr. Finney. Now, I knew about his issues. But anyway, Finney is in trouble for, for withholding federal taxes, stealing wages from his workers, essentially being one of the biggest slum lords in the city. He's got several Chicago Housing Authority contracts, and he was pocketing the money instead of providing services. He had elderly black folks living in uh, facilities that were not fit for human occupation, and not just elderly people, but disabled elderly people in these senior housing units. And they, weren't, they didn't have air conditioning in the hot Chicago summer, and they wouldn't have adequate heat. 
in the freezing, deadly Chicago winters. And even though, even though, you know, he was had enough money to, to, to address this, he didn't. Of course, he didn't pay Uncle Sam. And they said he's on the verge of losing his church, losing his private residence. And Finney used to drive around town. I'd see him all the time because he's a South Side icon. They would see him driving around all the time. And, and he had this big Lexus sedan. And I saw him like three days ago on 53rd Street. I was coming back from Whole Foods. And he was in this little broke down Honda. And I'm like, why is Finney driving that? That's weird. But I kept going. And I remember one time I went to this art gallery. And Finney was in there just buying up art, living big. So anyway, it's curious because Finney is not internationally known. But he is an icon and a world-known pe person. And when I was negotiating to try to secure this land for an urban farm site, one of his more than 200 properties, I was going to have him turn it over to Ecologic Outreach so we could run a farm. But, you know, long story short, we actually met up with the Alumni Association of Hales Franciscan, and they gave us a plot of land. So we got the HF Hales Franciscan Garden. So we, once we got our garden site, our farm site, and we've been running that urban farm for almost five years, or I think we just completed our fifth year going into our sixth. Uh, that's kind of where I ended my rigmarole and debating and, and, and back and forth with Doc Finney. And, you know, Doc Finney also had a radio show. So while we were doing that, he interviewed me on his show, Another Perspective, to talk about my ecological ambitions for the, the city of Chirac. But anyway, what's curious about this is Finney's been doing the same dirt for, for almost half a century. So why now? That's my question. My question is not, oh my God, Finney was, you know, stealing and, and hustling and grinding. Every single black leader in Chicago is a crook. Y'all don't remember when, when, when uh, what's his name, uh, Jesse Jackson had that love child out of wedlock and they found out that he was taking money from Rainbow Push and putting up his mistress in luxury condos or in, in and remember uh, Al Sharpton? Wasn't paying his bills for, for the headquarters of the National Action Network where that was in a filthy little office above a bodega while his mistress was living in the, high, uh, the penthouse at Trump Tower. All of these leaders do this dirt, but it never takes them down. Farrakhan created the atmosphere that led to the murder of Malcolm X. That was his own words. And yet he's still in a prominent position. So I'm thinking these black leaders, whether they're national leaders or regional, because Finney was not a national leader or a national icon. He was a regional or local leader and icon. And these guys have been doing this dirt, and everybody knows their dirt. And even the people who work with them snicker about all the corruption behind their back. Like, yeah, you know he ain't nothing. But then because they are the conduits. They are the conduits which white people use to funnel money into the community. And the reason they use people like Doc Finney and give him all these lands resources, the reason they use people like Messi Jesse, the reason they give money to even some, some black gangs like the El Rukins, they want to handpick people to give resources to that they know for a fact those resources will not go to truly empower the black community. They want to give people resources to sustain. But I think there is a changing of the guard going on. A lot of these leaders who have been in prominent positions since the 60s and 70s, Al Sharpton, Jesse Jackson, and Doc Finney, and many people like him, I can name some others, but I'm in enough trouble already saying those three names. Who did I name? Farrakhan, Al Sharpton, Jesse Jackson, and Doc Finney is one step underneath them. In fact, Doc Finney is one of the people that props them, them individuals up. But what they want to do is, they got a, they, Obama wants to move into that position. He's about to open an Obama Center, and he's about to start taking over poverty pimping and status quo sustaining of Chicago. Obama wants to be that icon into his old age. You also have people like Jay-Z. So the old guard, the, the old uh, Negro guard, the Negro leaders, the Negro icons, civil rights icons that haven't died are going to get pushed aside. And those that don't want to step down are going to end up like Dr. Finney. Now, that doesn't mean the conditions for the black masses has changed. 
They're not fighting to change things for us. They're fighting to sustain things for us, to keep us in our place. So a lot of these black people who had nothing to do with us, all of a sudden are going to become charity and, and doing charity, Jay-Z. So it's the changing of the guard. And nobody's consulting the black masses. It is the people on top, the white masters, and what they used to call the advisors to the king, the boule, as Steve Coakley would call them, advisors to the king, the people who sit at the right hand, not even at the right hand, they sit at the right foot in a little stool next to the throne. So as you see icons starting to be taken down, remember when Jesse Jackson went to Ferguson and they were throwing rocks at his car and they literally ran Jesse Jackson out of town and everybody was so happy when Al Sharpton got torn down by, uh, um, What's his name? Trump. And the same thing with that old, uh, uh, the congressman, the Negro congressman, congressional black con uh, congress. All the old guard is being taken down and they're putting in, they're inserting, they're inserting new leaders. But that doesn't mean anything for the black masses. Now, some black folks are going to be happy because there's fresh faces. Jay-Z's foundation. And Obama's opening, and Obama's got this not-for-profit, what is called, uh, My Brother's Keeper. And all these Black Lives Matter cats nobody ever heard of, they got no skin in the game, they come out of nowhere, and they sitting on T CNN discussing black issues. And don't nobody from their hood or community ever seen them in the streets or seen them organize a, a damn thing. So something's happening here, and what it is ain't exactly clear. But keep your eyes open, because they did this. Remember, Dr. King was in his 30s in Malcolm X. There was a whole establishment leadership before the civil rights movement. Deacons of self-defense, Abernathy's, King's mentor. And the white man said, well, these old people that would say, you know, the original story was the Lord will make a way somehow when here beneath the cross I bow. And no, don't worry about your sorrows today because you're going to get your rewards in a sweet by and by. So they literally been handpicking leaders for us for over a century. The first handpicked national leader was Booker T. Washington. And they used him. And then the second handpicked leader was W.B. Du Bois. And it's been a succession after that. And then when these old leaders either go off the reservation, like uh, D um, Booker T. Washington died, but he was a loyal servant to keep black folks in check, to bring the white message and wrap the white message in his black legitimacy and sell it to the black folks, the black masses. But W.B. Du Bois, he wasn't just a servant, he was a scholar. So a lot of times the facts and his research will contradict his actions. So then he was like, I'm going to go with the research. I'm going to go with the facts. And W.B. Du Bois went off the reservation. So they had to spank him and kick him to the curb. So sometimes the old leaders die off. Sometimes the old leaders go their own way and don't obey the rules. Sometimes the old leaders just overstay their welcome. And they have to cut them off at the knees, like Dr. Finney. I'm sure there was somebody coming up for Dr. Finney's spot and Dr. Finney refused to move. Because mm -hmm. even the article in the Chicago Tribune said, you know, he's been doing this for years. He's been doing this. He's been investigated. They found him doing the same thing in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Why in the uh, late term of the early 2000s, all of a sudden you're getting arrested for something you did since the 70s? It ain't had nothing to do with your crime when it go down like that. And Lori Lightfoot, and you know, Finney's uh, uh, benefactors, that was the Daly family. Rahm Emanuel was hand in hand playing footsies with him, but the old guard is gone. And I'm sure Lori Lightfoot want to bring in her own shysters. So anyway, that's another story y'all should follow. I'm not going to be following that story. I think it's sad this man had to go out that way, but I think it's even worse, the thousands, the hundreds of thousands of African families that he exploited. Absolute tragedy. Let's move on. This is the Bro Diallo Show, Q4 Radio.
Um, I want to talk about black cults or just cults in general and the scourge, which are the scourge of the conscious community. But all I have to say, you can listen to Q4 Radio if you're in the city of Chicago at on your AM radio dial 1680. Also, if you're outside the city of Chicago, you can listen on the TuneIn app, iTunes Radio, or at the website www.q4.org. You can listen, you can learn, you can contribute, you can participate. Right there. Um, so, now that's out of the way. Oh, also, if you can, become a contributor, become a Patreon. Oh, and also, there's this new thing. I don't know if it's on there yet. But actually, it was just, um, I don't remember who called and told me that. Hold on. Uh, I think I'm set up for Super Chat. So you can make contributions on the YouTube feed. I think that works. So that's another way. Because some people say, you know, I can't become a Patreon. I can't make regular donations. I just had Brother Kaabana call me um, about a... Uh, another some other work uh we're doing but he was like i want to make a contribution but i ain't about to do no do the patreon i just can't set that up right now so anyway that day that later yesterday i, I set up super chat on this so if you watch the youtube live feed you can support the show and make a contribution right there on the 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 YouTube live feed. So I'm trying to set up, facilitate ways because I know I, a lot of people want to support and I know the best way to get support in order to sustain and or expand the show is to give people as many convenient uh, ways to, to kick in as possible. So that's another thing, the, the, the super chat. You can make a direct contribution on YouTube. So that's that and we're right there. So anyway, let's con continue on. Let's I'm just messing with the camera now. And y'all got me thinking about YouTube now. I'm self-conscious. So I used to just do this without any video. So I could come in here in my, my pajamas. In a torn tank top. And stains on my shirt. Didn't have to shave, cut my hair, or nothing. I just stroll in here and, 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 and jawbone. But now, that it's on the video, I have to somehow make sure a brother fresh. A brother is dipped. <laughs> anyway. That's enough humor. We gotta talk about something serious. Um, today's show is cults, the scourge of the conscious community. And I've been dealing with cults since my entry into the conscious community. And I'm not saying that cults don't exist outside the conscious community. A lot of people like to jump down on the conscious community and talk about how they don't deal, why they don't deal with that black stuff, why they ain't with the conscious community and all that. And I'll tell y'all right now, the conscious community is the only true community, the only real black community in the United States. Because if you're not black conscious, then your community is some subsect or some sub genre of, a, of the larger dominant white community. I So, what is the conscious community first? Let's define our terms. The conscious community is that loosely associated population of black people who try to live beyond the status quo. That's all it is. Black people who are more deliberate in their lifestyle choices and how they dress, how they wear their hair, how they eat, where they live, who they associate with and for what purposes they associate with, how they earn their money, how they spend their money, how they construct their interpersonal and intimate relationships. They try to look more in depth at the things they do and the larger impacts of their actions beyond just their own individual selves. They look at the historical, societal, political, cultural, social impacts of their actions and they try to guide and direct their actions to have mostly a positive or deliberate impact on themselves and their environment. The unconscious population simply goes with the status quo. There are people that you know who were born and they eat the same things they were taught to eat when they were born. They believe the same things that they were taught to believe from birth. 
They dwell in the same spaces that they were told, and I don't mean physical spaces. When I say dwell in the same spaces, in the Christians, amongst academia, amongst the Negro capitalists, and things of that nature. So the same intellectual, social, cultural spaces. And I've had to ask people that I've interacted with in the past, can you tell me something that was driven into you, that was taught to you, that was imposed on you, that was indoctrinated into you from your childhood that you've gone against? Have you gone against anything? Is there any ma major change besides your shoe size and your hairstyle that you've gone through? Have you gone through any type of personal transformation in your entire life? And some people will say, no, I do what my daddy did. I do what my granddaddy did. And I do what my granddaddy's great granddaddy did. I do that. That's how I do. And that's how I teach my children to do. And you have people say, oh, we are, we are a basketball family or we are a Raiders fan. And the whole family of Raiders fan. They just pass on these traditions without any critical examination. So the conscious individual is a person who gives critical thoughts to all things in their lives and then tries to take deliberate actions to, to either transform, adjust, or even further go into deeper depth in the things they do. That's all it is. And the conscious community is one of the most mocked and hated populations in the entire black community because... People who are down with the status quo, people who are stagnant, people who are fixed are very hostile to the notion that there is a capacity for change. It scares them. Even if they're in a negative position, to many people, familiarity is better, familiar suffering is better than unfamiliar pain relief. And we weren't always called the conscious community. We used to be called crazy niggas. There'd be an African man on the plantation that don't want to eat the chitlins and pick the cotton and bow to master. But he didn't really have the wherewithal to run away or fight, but he would come up with ways to slight the system, to undermine the system, to buck the system. Sometimes they'd run. And the content slaves would call these people, the slaves who resisted, the slaves who fought back, the sneaky slaves who would steal from master, the, the, the bad house slave that would spit in the master's pot and piss in the master's shoes. The complacent slaves would be like, y'all such hypocrites. One day you bucking master and the next day you're picking cotton loyally. One day you're spitting master's soup and the next day you're ironing his shirt. Because they don't understand the process and the evolution of consciousness, the struggle of consciousness. Because if consciousness and being a conscious individual is easy, everybody would be conscious. So the people were like, I'm not conscious. I don't have any internal sh a struggle. I don't have any internal con contradictions. I go with the flow. I love the Lords. I do my work and I makes no trouble. So they seem like they're not as hypocritical, that they're not as inconsistent, that they're not as dysfunctional as conscious people but they are already dead. If you're not fully conscious, if you're not always evolving, you are the walking dead. Or what Dr. Amos Wilson said, you suffer from somnambulistic ambulatorism, meaning you are sleepwalking through life. So the conscious black Africans on the plantation were called crazy slaves, crazy niggas. They were said they had draftomania. They had the madness. And then later, they kept calling them the crazy niggas. They would call them Garveyites. They started calling us black radicals. Look at those black radicals, those crazy Garveyites marching up and down the street, making acting a damn fool, making asses of themselves. They need to get a job. They need to take off all them funny clothes and stop using those funny African words and just go on and get a job and act like they got some sense. They've been saying that back in the 1800s, the 1900s, the 19-teens, the 1920s, the 1930s, the 1940s, all down the line. The, the complacent black population has hated on the conscious community. Now, I know it has blown up in the era of the Internet with the now we went from being called the so-called conscious or the conscious community. Now they're calling us hoteps. They take our own words and lingo and use it against us. But that's all. If you're a black person who says, you know, 
Why do we eat these foods? Why do we wear these clothes? Why do we work these jobs? What is money? And what is value? Is value and money the same thing? Do I want to spend my life earning? And when I do get a little money, what's the best use of it? Should I go buy nice clothes? And who am I trying to impress? Who am I? Why am I? Why is this? Why do things have to be the way they are? Can they be different? Can I improve society? Can I improve myself? That's all consciousness is. Constantly examining, constantly questioning, constantly trying to make improvements. That's all consciousness is. That's all it is. There are several manifestations. Some black folks say, I got to shave my head. Some black folks say, I got to grow my Nazi dreadlocks down to the ground. It takes different manifestation. Some black women say, I'm going to expose myself. I'm going to free. I'm going to let my breasts fly. And I'm not going to cover myself in shame. I'm going to embrace my body. Some women say, hey, I'm going to be more modest. I'm going to wrap my head and wear them, you know. But it's all conscious. But people look, oh, you got half the conscious community, titties flapping. Other half of the conscious community wearing burkas. Ain't nothing wrong with that. That's, that is showing that we, the internal struggle, the external struggle, it's all struggle. And what do they say? Iron sharpens iron. We make each other strong. We're all working to a common goal, even though we're using different paths to reach that goal. I love the conscious community. I am a proud member of the conscious community. And every time I see these complacent status quo Negroes trying to diss or call out the conscious community, I jump up to defend the conscious community. Because if you're not conscious, you're not fully alive. Oppressed people must be conscious, radical, crazy, constantly evolving and adapting and fighting and struggling. And reevaluating, reassessing, and then jumping back in the middle of this. So I am a champion of the conscious community. Conscious black people are the most valuable and cherished black people. Yeah, they better than you. Conscious black folks. Keep y'all head up. I ain't trying to get into no Tupac here. Even Tupac, you know, one day he's a thug, next day he's fighting for the people. I understand that. I know we go through changes. It's a metamorphosis. It is not a struggle. It is the struggle. And everybody who's made a pun that, that allow me to sit here in this seat and talk about white folks like a dog without a lynch mob standing out front, everybody who's, who's able to go and work a job or achieve anything in this still racist system, whatever openings were made in this system, whatever resistance and concessions and rewards we won from this system, it was a result of conscious black people. You ain't got nothing from white folks. You ain't got nothing from Uncle Tom status quo, house Negroes. Everything you have came from Fred Hampton. Came from Marcus Garvey. Came from Huey P. It came from Dr. King. It came from Stokely Carmichael slash Kwame Ture. Everything we have of value in this country as black people, we got from the crazy niggas, from the black radicals, from the black nationalists, from the black rioters. OK. It didn't come from the Condoleezza's rights and the Obamas, the status quo scared niggas. And then we turn around and oh, look at that whole tap. Now, I'm not against criticism again. At the same time, I give the biggest shout outs to the conscious community. I am the biggest critic of the conscious community. I am the number one mocker and call outer, whatever the hell that is, of the conscious community. I understand there are a million and one problems with the conscious community. But my goal is to improve the conscious community, not to exit it, not to tear it down, but to build it up and improve it, to refine it, to polish it, to fix it. So that's what conscious is. So why are skulls? Oh, yeah, Dr. Khalid Abdul Muhammad. I, I started, I quoted him when I got on the air. I, I said, I won't be long, but I must be strong. Don't say don't forget Dr. Khalid. Ain't nobody forgot Dr. Khalid. Can't never forget Dr. Shiny. Beautiful, bald head black man. He called himself that. He said he was a beautiful, bald head black man. Self-love, that's another thing, component of consciousness. So now that we've defined, I hopefully help you to understand what kind. And like I said, consciousness takes many manifestations. To me, I am a secularist. I am atheist AF. And then you have a lot of conscious people who are spiritual, hippie, all head in the clouds. And I know they searching like I'm searching. I have to play that. I have to put that on my Don's Hall list. Searching and searching. Anyway, 
So what's the point in saying all that? You have to understand what I say when I say conscious community. Because when I say conscious community, most black people are rolling their eyes. Oh, most of y'all are hating. But I love the conscious community. And without the conscious community, we are doomed as a people. But that's the thing. People were hating on Harriet. Harriet had to carry a pistol. Now, the same Negroes that hated on Harriet after emancipation was like, yeah, I was down with Harriet. But Harriet had to carry a pistol. And Harriet, when she was interviewed, said, I didn't carry this pistol for the white man. The white man had cannons and muskets and dogs. This little pistol wasn't going to do them no harm. If the white man caught me, I was caught. I carried this pistol for these sellout Negroes. Same thing. Martin Luther King, before he was shot by the feds, he was stabbed by a black person. Marcus Garvey was sold out by men like Baba Wire burning fire. Baga Wire. Garvey was betrayed. But the same black folks that, 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 that betrayed Garvey, that would have snitched on Harriet, same mentality that the black woman that stabbed Dr. King in his chest, same black idiot Pianchi with your dumb ass on my Facebook feed talking about your support for Trump. As soon as I get home, I'm blocking your ass, you dumb ass. Sick of your crap. Can I say ass? I think I can say ass. Donkey. Yeah, Jesus rode into Bethlehem on a donkey. No, not Bethlehem. Wherever. Where did Jesus ride in to get his butt kicked? Such a dumb story. You worship such a dumb guy. You got enough sense to save yourself. I digress. Anyway. They talk about us like a dog, but then they're going to tell their grandkids about how they were down with the movement. A lot of y'all uncles and aunties and grandparents who talk about how they were down with the movement were not down with Dr. King. Less than 5% of the black masses actually were active in the civil rights movement. Less than 1% of the black enslaved population rose up and rebelled. So the same people calling us hoteps in their 20s and 30s and 40s, when they get to be 60s and their children are reading history about us and about our resistance and our struggles, our, our taking it to the streets to fight for their futures, we fighting for people we may never meet. We fighting for resources and rewards we may never enjoy. We fighting for opportunities that we will never exercise because that's what conscious people do. And then those same people will be talking to their kids, oh yeah, I remember bro Diallo hating on me, never supported me. Uh, most of the people that tell you about, yeah, I know Malcolm, didn't stand with Malcolm. People, yeah, Dr. King, they didn't stand with Dr. King. They lie, that's, that's the sick cycle. That's the sick, ongoing cycle. And we keep letting it happen. So anyway, but that's the conscious community. I hope I have given some clarity about what the conscious community is because a lot of people lie about the conscious community. And here's another thing. Everything you find wrong with the conscious community, a lot of sneaking around, two-timing people, messing with other people's spouses, a lot of uh, hypocrisy. You find a lot of theft. You know, these, these demagogues, sucker-ass leaders stealing. A lot of every single problem you find in the conscious community, you find outside the conscious community. But people want to blow it up when it happens in the conscious community, even though it happens to a lesser degree and less intensity within the conscious community. You know, people more mad at Dr. Umar for stealing some money. They more mad at Dr. Umar for stealing some money for a school, a non-existent school, and I'm mad at them too. And But they ain't mad at Obama for killing hundreds of thousands of people and destroying an entire uh, Gulf ecosystem, among other things. So I'm saying, if you more mad at Dr. Umar than you are at the Obamas, now if you're equally mad at Obama and Umar, you ain't conscious. But if you celebrate Obama and you condemn Dr. Umar as a hotel, not only are you not conscious, you are brain dead. So yeah, and like I said, I don't celebrate Umar, I don't support Umar, I mock Umar, and I think Umar is a problem within the community that he either needs to chickety check himself or, or step off. But I keep it in perspective. Hustling people over a school is different than bombing people from, the, from a drone. 
Ain't nobody lost their life. You might lose a few dollars, but ain't nobody lost their life. So we got to get it in perspective. But you notice how people are so much harder on anything the conscious community do because they want to tear down the conscious community and they want to integrate into the systems and institutions of global white domination. So that's what a conscious community is. And why do I call the scourge, cults the scourge of the conscious community? Here's the thing. When someone becomes conscious, when I became conscious, for some reason we become, not any for some reason, I'm going to explain why. When people start to become conscious, when they get woke, one thing you realize when you become conscious, either after you become conscious or you realize this before you become conscious and then you're like, I've been lied to all my life. And when you realize you've been lied to all your life, you look for alternatives. You start to seek truth. So you raised as a Christian, eating swine, you might have ideas about a man, I'm a man, or I'm a lady, I must be, you know, I must be chaste and meek. I must be a help me. I'm a man, I must dominate head of household. And you become conscious. You become conscious of who you are, you become conscious of the world. So you start to seek out alternatives. And there are a lot of organizations and individuals that realize that when you go into that seeking phase, and that's the thing about why a lot of conscious people seem hypocritical. You meet somebody one week, what's up, man? Hey, how you doing? The next week you meet them, assalamu alaikum, my brother. The next week you meet them, hotel alafia, my brother. Next week you meet them, they like, hey, what's up, my nigga? And you see them like, every time I see you, you're on something different. One minute you got on the dashiki, next week, yeah, hey, Rastafari, I and I. Because you go into that seeking phase, like you have to abandon everything that you were given. You have to abandon what, how you used to eat, how you used to dress, how you used to worship, how you used to interact with your family and friends and even your spouse. And so you're looking like, damn, how could I be so blind for so long? Even people, when I became conscious in, at 12, 13 years old, I'm like, damn, why did it take so long? How could I not see this white Jesus ain't no God of mine? How could I see that, you know, trying to go to school and be a good Negro don't mean a damn thing under white domination? So you start seeking. When I became conscious, first thing I did was ran to Moss 47 on Truth Avenue in Kansas City, Missouri, and I was going to join the Nation of Islam. Because I read The Fall of America, I read Message to the Black Man in America, and I had some of my dad's old Malcolm X speeches. And I ran to the, to, to the mosque. Because I was like, I ain't going back to church. I ain't no damn Baptist. I'll never set foot in Covenant Memorial Baptist Church again where I was raised up in and I was baptized. I ain't going back. But then I'm in limbo. So I'm like, if the Christians got it wrong, let's go see what the Muslims got. Thankfully, I'm so grateful the Muslims actually didn't let me join. I'm probably the only black man that was, I wasn't even a black man. I was a black child back then. I was kicked out. They was like, nah, this ain't the place for you. And they were right. They knew, better. They knew me better than I knew myself back then. So I showed up at, at the meeting. We used to have these off-site meetings. And I knock at the door where we were supposed to meet and talk about message to the black man in America and talk about what it meant to be become a Muslim. And uh, my problem was I knew a little bit too much about Islam because my father and my two older brothers were all Muslims. So I wasn't ignorant of Islam. But my grandmother told me since I was a little boy, the Muslims will get you. They got Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. They got Muhammad Ali. If you're not careful, the Muslims will get you. So through my early childhood, you know, even though I'd be going to the masjid with my, my older brothers and my fathers, I'd be thinking to myself, the Muslims will get me. I got to be careful. You know, I got to sit here and eat this fish sandwich and enjoy this bean pie, but I can't let the Muslims get me. <laughs> so after I rejected Christianity, I'm like, I'm going to go over here to Islam, and then Islam rejected me. And so, of course, I started looking into African spirituality. And one of the problems why, because even though I've gone through the conscious community and I've interacted and I've been around just about every cult within the conscious community, I've never been susceptible to a cult. I don't know why. But I've never been. And let me tell you, let's define what a cult is. A cult is a new religion and a religion is an old cult. 
under the Roman Empire, up until Constantine made it the official religion of the empire, Christianity was a cult. Islam was a cult until the Prophet Muhammad took over uh, Saudi, what's called Saudi Arabia, Mecca, and Medina until he built up his forces in Africa under the protection of the Ethiopians. He built up his forces to take over. It's like, you know, Mormonism. Mormonism is making its transition from a cult to an established religion. So that's all it is. It's a, it's a non-established religion. And be, but because it doesn't have the establishment, because you notice major religions are embedded in the society. So they're embedded into the entire culture. Major religions are embedded within the economy, the consciousness, the hol federal holidays, the national holidays and traditions. The established religions have been around long enough in order to get embedded in all aspects of the society. They're inescapable. So if you go to Senegal or Saudi Arabia, you can't escape the religion even in so-called secular societies. You come to the United States, you can't escape Christianity. You go to a federal building, they're trying to put up the Ten Commandments. That's what a religion, whereas with a cult, the cults are not fully inundated, haven't fully saturated the society. The cult, cults often exist in isolated pockets within a society, not awash throughout the society. You know, then most people don't even know about all the cults. But anyway, that was my experience. Me and two of my homies, Troy and uh, Sage. Well, his name was Randall. I can tell names now. It's been a long because I ain't really, I ain't lying on nobody, get nobody in trouble. But we went to the to the study group, the Nation of Islam study group, and they kicked us out of the study group. And when they kicked us out of the Nation of Islam study group, we figured it wasn't much chances of us becoming some bow tie uh, wearing uh, uh, bean pot hustlers. So we went our own way. And I was really hurt by that. I'm like, wow, you know, my father always told me I'd make a good Muslim. But then my father didn't like the Nation of Islam. He felt that they weren't real Muslims and all that. But anyway, when I went off to college. And for that time, I started looking into, I didn't actually immediately start to study African spirituality. I actually started studying um, the politics, the Afrocentric ideas. So culture and politics of Afrocentricity and black nationalism. And I kind of left spirituality on the uh, back burner. But when I got to New York, New York is like literally, for lack of a better term, a hub or a mecca for black spirituality and black religion and black cults. Brooklyn, New York City especially, you find the intersection of all these black religious organizations and individuals and ideologies. So... The first time I ever really knew, I didn't know anything about African spirituality except voodoo, black magic, you know, or what I learned in school where they would call it um, animism. But I knew nothing about the details until I moved to New York in 1992. I came across this book called The Matuna Terre, The Great Oracle of Tahuti and the Egyptian System of Spiritual Cult uh, Cultivation, Volume 1, by uh, the Shechem of Shechem Ra Un Nefa Amen. But by this time, I was very jaded on religion and spirituality and the supernatural. But I saw this book and I read it and I'm like, this is so interesting because this was the very first time I ever knew anything in depth about how Africans related to the supernatural. I learned about African folklore, African mythology, you know, African concepts of divinity. Africans' myths and, and stories about the founding of the universe and the nature of existence itself. I never had that in my house. Do I get to be 18 years old, 18 year old black man, and I never learned this? It is really criminal that nobody teaches this to African people. And that was the first book I read on anything related to African spirituality from an Afrocentric or African point of view. And I was so excited by this book, I bought two extra copies. And I mailed one to, I mailed two of them to friends. One of them I mailed to uh, this brother, Troy, who'd been one of my best friends. You know, he was one year behind me. So I was a freshman in college, he was a senior in high school. And I mailed him this book. And I'm like, this is one of the most amazing books, you know, because I've read history. I've read politics and culture. I was even reading biographies of great black men, and I would read African humor. 
I was just really consuming everything I could from an African centric. We used to call it Afrocentric. Now and then they all started saying Afro African centric. But back in the 80s and 90s, it was the Afrocentric movement and the black books movement. And I read all the books by Dale Jones. He had a couple he hadn't published yet, but up to that time, I read all the books. Before I met Dale Jones, I read everything he wrote. And I read some of Amos Wilson. Dr. Clark, and I used to go, and there were black bookstores everywhere in the 80s and 90s. You couldn't throw a rock in the hood without hitting a black bookstore. And I took that for granted. I didn't appreciate that. And I used to go to the Du Bois Learning Center, and there was a bookstore there, and, and uh, First World Books, and then in Kuru Books, bookstores, and, 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 and uh, writers and readers books. There were bookstores everywhere even in Kansas City, even over in Kansas, even at the malls. This was in the era of the shopping malls. Every shopping mall that, was re that, w that serviced the black community had a black bookstore in it. And that don't even count the corporate or white bookstores. There were bookstores everywhere, pre-internet, I guess, pre-Barnes and Nobles. But anyway, I'd never seen this book until I got to New York. And I bought this, my first copy from this brother named Woza, and I'm going to talk more about that. I need to pick up the pace. But anyway, I mailed this book to my homie, who was another young black man who was emerging into consciousness. And when I read the book, I'm like, this is really interesting. But I read it from more of an archaeological and historical and philosophical point of view. I didn't read it and take any of it literally. Whereas my homie did. He um, changed his name from Troy to Kenefra Amun Aba. He got a kinetic name. He joined the Asar Set Society. Him and his girl both joined the Asar Set Society, and they moved to, to Virginia to live on the compound for some time. He totally got enveloped with the cult, the Asar Set Society. And yes, it's a cult. I know that's going to offend some of y'all. But he totally got in with the cult. Me, I went to, when they were on Atlantic Avenue, I would go to some of their Tree of Life classes, and I would go to their restaurant because they were vegan and eat some of their food. I went to a couple of their rituals because them sisters in those rituals could dance. But all the whole time, I'm ne I never became a member of the Asara Set Society and not for once did I ever. Like, yeah, I'm going to believe that the Ankhosaur and Ab Man and I can ascend and all that and, and the oracles and to, to predict the futures and commune with the ants. I never believed that for one second. Not for one second. Oh, maybe. But I was reading this stuff mostly from an anthropological point of view. But my homeboy got completely wrapped up in the cult. And I'm not going to tell his whole story. But he told me he's no longer a member of this community. His name is still a comedic name because, you know, he legally changed it. But he said, being involved with this organization, and he went from the Asar Set Society and saw oh, they were corrupt. And, you know, he went to the rituals and they took tens of thousands of dollars from him. He put all this money in there and, and uh, he saw just wasn't happy with how it operated because it's a cult. It was doing everybody, look, you know, doing cult things. So then he left that cult and joined the Fahami Temple in, in Oklahoma. And he was he was being initiated into the priesthood of the Fahami Temple. And again, he spent thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars with this organization. So he hopped from cult to cult, and eventually he became completely secular, I believe. I haven't spoke to him in years. We don't talk anymore, but he became an atheist and a capitalist. He abandoned the conscious community. He went back to the status quo. He wanted to make big money. He wanted to be Jay-Z. I don't know. But anyway, I just, he and I don't, are not friends. We don't talk anymore, but I'm, I'm, but, you know, I'm not going to lie on the brother. But he abandoned it. But he told me at one time, he's like, being part of these organizations was like being addicted to drugs. So you had a young man who was in high school, a senior in high school, is when he first entered the cult. And for almost 15 years, throughout his entire 20s, most of his 30s, he was involved in one cult or another. And when I say involved, I don't mean just, you know, reading the books and going to to a meeting. He be totally embodied and became a full-on member. And they exploited and took some of the best years of his life. And a young brother who wanted to fight for black liberation ended up fighting, you know, sitting down, meditating on the Bull of Ra 
and buying all these herbs and tinctures and all these study guides and, 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 and mystical crystals and caught up in all this, spending all this money for his name change. And, you know, when you get your name change, it's not just filling out the, month, the paperwork with the government. He had his name had to be discovered and he had to go and, and do this astrological chart. It was tens of thousands of dollars for this holy priest to give him his your divine name. So it ain't just like you pick a name out of a book. And then when they give you your name, you were supposed to your name is supposed to dictate how you live. And so, you know, you were supposed to go into the priesthood because you were Kenefra Amunabad. It was a mess. And the whole time I'm telling them, like, listen, this stuff, I kind of hate that I sent you this book. I thought you was going to rock with it like I was rocking with it. Some really interesting insights into the psychology, mentality, history of African people. But this is not a book to live your life by. It's not rational. It's not scientific. It's not fact-based. There's a lot to be learned from here, but this is not, you know, we start using African folklore and African mythology the same way Christians use the Bible. I'm like, you can think independently of this book. And I would talk to him for many years and I'd be like, hey, man, what's up, man? man the universe is in flux. Like, what the hell are you talking about? Yo, the universe, man, you don't understand. And he start calling me an ab man, that I'm at the lowest and talking about my vibration and my chakras. And, you know, I lost a friend behind this cult nonsense. And, and like I said, his story is indicative of a lot of conscious people that want to get out here and fight for liberation, and they end up caught up in this absurd this web. And after, I, that was comedic. And the popular is comedic African religions, Akan and Yoruba. So I started to read again about Yoruba, the uh, Ibasha, Orisha, Ipa Proverbs, Folktales, Sacred History, and Prayers, the um, handbook of, of, of Yoruba religious practices. And I had this brother who was a uh, training to be a Baba Lao, and he would come to my house and help me to erect these shrines. And while I was erecting shrines, because I went through, because the entire time that I was conscious, especially in my early years, I was constantly trying to either be recruited into a cult or adopted into a cult. Either try, someone trying to get me to join a cult or join a cult of personality. And I've never been a member of any cult. And even if you would see me at, 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 at the, uh, even if you would see me at the, um, at the drum circle, the Haitian drum circle, even if you would see me at the, at the, the, the uh, Akan ritual, even if you see me at the Tree of Life uh, classes at the Asar Set Society, I'm not a believer. I am a student. I am a very curious person. But it was the, 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 the amount of struggle I had to do to not be seduced into these cults. So I would erect a shrine. Because I met this brother who sold me, first started teaching me about African spirituality and took me to my first rituals and drum circles. A brother named Woza. We had this organization, well, he had this organization called Sons of Man, and not S-O-N, but S-U-N. And these brothers were supposed to illuminate the way. And I really liked this group. And brothers, we had to be, because I was a vegan at the time, but these brothers were raw foodists. They didn't eat any cooked food. They were mostly fruitarian raw foodists. They only ate raw, organic, uncooked, uncontaminated, unmixed food. It was a pure, holistic diet, drinking pure water, you know. Just eating food almost out of the ground. And we had a strenuous training schedule. Brother Natural, you remember, we used to go to uh, Prospect Park and we'd run for three hours, you know, and running these obstacle courses and training in the martial arts and with primitive weapons. And it's all about discipline. And going to the, to the uh, Yoruba and the Khan priestess to, to learn about African. And it was a very cultish group. And those brothers were like, we only go to wear African garb. And I'm like, uh, Anything that I own is African. If it's mine, it's African. I go buy me a tight Toyota, and once I own that Toyota, that is an African Toyota. What's ours is ours. People can take our stuff, colonize our land, and call it theirs, and we can't call what's ours ours. So they wanted me to dress up in these African costumes. And I'm like, dude, we're in Brooklyn, New York City. We're riding on the grimy ass two train to Eastern Parkway, and you want me to wear, dress up like a Maasai herdsman? 
That doesn't make sense to me, so I'm not doing it. So I'd be out with the brothers I organized and building training with, and they're all wearing these African garbs, and there I am in some Drabo jeans and a hoodie and some ASIC sneakers. And then they were like, brother, you must wear your crown. And I'm like, I don't understand. So they used to have these cloth hats that they wear crowns that set to the side. And they would always, and one time we were going to this uh, con ritual where the priestess would evoke the spirit of Shango. She was possessed by Shango. And we would dance and, and, and get invigorated by, by the, the uh, ancestors, by the, 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 the Orisha. I might, like, wow, this is interesting. But these brothers are like, nah, she was truly possessed by Shango. And I'm like, I don't think she, you know, she just started speaking with a gravelly voice and spitting bourbon on us. I don't think that's what possession is. I didn't see her do anything supernatural. So I was in the group, but I was always like the, the, the project. Like everybody was trying to fix me. And I'm like, I'm here to do the work. How do we subvert the agendas of our oppressors and empower and advance our people's interest? That's what I'm here for. And all this other stuff, dressing up in African cosplay and all this other, you know, ancestral possession. It's interesting as hell. I like doing it, you know, but, you know, I was 18 years old. So I was up in the uh, sound factory. I was at the, uh, the Roxy and the freaking uh, tunnel. I was in them little, you know, uh, grimy Guyanese. Uh, restaurants, you know, they would turn the restaurants into illegal nightclubs. They move all the table against one wall and turn on the dance hall and whiny, whiny, whiny. And so I, and everybody was like, yo, you know, brother, you need to check yourself. You need to do self-examination. I'm like, what? I don't understand. So I would never get with, I'm like, you know, this is, this is some cultist stuff, you know, and the cult is when, 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 when the ritual becomes more important than the individual. When the mission gets tangled up into one person. And if I had a different disposition, but I grew up in the church, so I was always weary of somebody trying to dictate things to me. And I always would say, give me an evidence-based, rational explanation for doing this or not doing this. And plus, I was still working through my Christian indoctrination, my Islamic indoctrination, my Western indoctrination. At the same time, I'm coming out. Like I said, consciousness is not, okay, one day you woke and one day you sleep and next day you woke. It ain't like that. It is an evolution. It is an internal, ongoing struggle to this day. And so, when you're in your searching mode, so I personally have been recruited by cults. I have had individuals when I think I'm joining a political organization and it turns out to be a cult. And, you know, the next show, because I'm getting late in time, I want to talk about the characteristics of cults. This is going to be a multi-part thing. But I want to tell you, all even though Bro Diallo is a secular atheist, I didn't go through it with these cults. And some sister just asked me a couple of days ago, why do you argue with these people? Why do you go back and forth? I was talking to some dude. And he was talking some nonsense about the homosexual agenda. And his sister came to me and was like, you know, I don't really have time to talk. And I told her, listen, everything that I am, I used to be something else. I'm a vegan now, a strict vegan. But I used to eat government cheese, pork chop, scrapple, hog head cheese, chitlins, lunch meat. And so... Because somebody was patient with me, I remember there was this one sister. We used to call her Kwanzaa Chick. That was the nickname we had for her because we would only see her at Kwanzaa. She was, I was in high school, she was in college, and we'd see her. And she was like the only like militant, conscious, dreadlock black woman we knew. So we'd see her at Kwanzaa, and she'd sit there and give us all these lectures. And she was the first vegan I ever met. And I think I was maybe 15 years old, and she was the first vegan I ever met. And she used to say, you know, and so we stopped eating pork, and we thought, oh, yeah, we don't eat pork, because we, we woke. And she was like, but you eat beef, and you eat yogurt, and you eat dairy. And I was like, what? But anyway, she would talk to us and debate, and when she'd go off to school, she, she, was, she seemed like a woman to us, but she was like in her early 20s. But we were in, like, high school, so she was a, a full-on woman to us. But anyway, she was very patient. She was very, very patient with us. And so I was a meat eater. I was a sexist. I was a homophobe. I was a, 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 a dysfunctional, militant, black nationalist, hyper-militant 
you know, kill whitey type irrational reactionary. I was everything that I'm not now. And every one of those stages of enlightenment and development, somebody fought through my hard headedness, whether it's my wife, whether it's uh, Brother Dale and, and Professor Mackey. I had people, so she, I had to explain to her, listen, I used to be that dude. So what would I look like? How hypocritical would I be? It's like, oh, I'm going to cancel this dude. I'm going to cut him off. I'm going to make fun. I'm going to expose him, and then I'm going to cut him off. So I go back and forth as long as, you know, the dialogue is not too dehumanizing. You know, as long as it don't go to threats where people are making, you know, threats of violence. If they want to call me names, I just had some guy call me ignorant and stupid because I told him that there was no soul and there was no spirit and the dude was wilding out. Dude was mad as sin. You so ignorant. You so that. I, I don't mind name calling. But, you know, I was talking to this other brother who's a black Greek. He's a, a fraternity cat. Same thing. He went off on me. You so ignorant. You so I don't mind people cuss me out. You know, talk about me, my mama. Talk about, you know, my fly sundown sweatshirt my wife bought me. You know, make fun of this fly sweatshirt I got. You know, tear me down as best as you want. As long as it don't go, I have my limits too, but I work with people. I continue to work with people and work on people to discuss people. You know, I call it reality therapy. Because I know when these people are trying to wake up, it's hard. Because the system is not only relentless in this indoctrination of African people, it is very good at it. It is so good. This system is cold-blooded. They, they're good. Even Dale Jones, who hate everything about white domination and white aggression and Western civilization. He hates everything about it, but he said, damn, they good. Dr. Bobby E. Rice said they're very smart. Don't think just because somebody's evil, they're not intelligent. So I understand. And because I know there are people throughout my life who worked with me as I was becoming conscious. And if I was, you know, 14 years old, waking up, reading Elijah Muhammad and reading Malefe Asante and, 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 and reading uh, uh, Kwame Ture and running up talking about I'm a socialist before I even knew what the hell a socialist was. Or I became a vegan and I didn't even know how to properly be a vegan. And I'm eating things that have dairy products in it or I'm eating candy bars and I don't really understand as I'm learning about veganism and reading Mucusless Diet Healing System and reading Heal, Heal Thyself by Queen of Fool and getting a greater understanding. But as I'm getting that understanding, I might be caught out there. You eating that, that got dairy in it. Or I'd eat some candy and you know, oh, that got pork in it. I could have been canceled a million and one times. If I was awakening or becoming conscious in the Twitter era, and the kind of things I would have posted to Twitter, you know, I would have been canceled a million times. So I think we need to be conscious because what we do a lot of times when we start to attack these people who are coming into consciousness is we drive them into the hands of cults. And the cult, what the cults do without exception is derail people. We take potential revolutionaries and potential freedom fighters and turn them into cultists. And they no longer become effective for the liberation of their people. They begin to attack the people, to think they're above the people, to, to even deem the people unworthy of being uh, uh, elevated, to being, to being enlightened. And people think, say all the time, go read Malcolm X's autobiography. You'll find that the Nation of Islam and Elijah Muhammad did not enlighten Malcolm X. They didn't wake Malcolm X up. Malcolm X was already on the path of consciousness. And he was in his searching stage. And he got caught up in the nation after he already embarked on his path of consciousness. And I argue, and the evidence and history supports me, that the cult derailed his development. I got old recordings of Malcolm X talking about Yakub and the evil scientist and the grafting of the white man and how the, your, your, your nappy hair is a result of our hard living. And if we start to live a righteous life, our hair becomes the same texture as our eyebrows. I got recordings of Malcolm X talking this nonsense. And at the same time, he had to carry the line. He had to carry the rhetoric forward of his organization because he had organizational discipline. But at the same time, he was studying with Dr. Ben. He was studying with Dr. Clark and getting the real facts. 
And when he was like, I got to let this cult stuff go, I need to become a secular leader of my people because my people need secularism and leave your religion in the closet, leave it at home. That's when the uh, Nation of Islam cooperated with, with COINTELPRO to kill him. And a lot of organizations devolve into cults or cults of personalities and became taken over by demagogues. And like Malcolm said, we had something good. The niggas came and messed it up. So this is something we need to deliberately be aware of and deliberately challenge. It's not something we can casually just let play out in the background. So Monday, I'm going to talk about the characteristics of cult and give some specifics on what you can do to avoid falling into a cult, helping other people fall into a cult, or help to bring people out of cult. But I just had to clarify, what is a cult? Why are so many conscious black people caught up in cults? It's not our fault, it's, but it is our responsibility. And we need to start to shun these cults, ban these cults. If you have an organization that is evolving in cult, y'all know uh, uh, Brother Ghazi, and he talks about the Uhuru movement and the cultist behaviors within the Uhuru movement. And I know everybody, and I'm going to say names, from Brother uh, Ajani to, to Brother Abbasi. I know a lot of refugees from the Uhuru organizations, and they confirm what Ghazi's saying. So just because you're not in a religious-based or spiritual-based organization, if you're in a supposedly uh, secular organization, many secular organizations take on characteristics of cults. People even come to me and it's like, brother, you're a strong voice in the community. You need to do this and do that. And they're literally trying to get me to behave as a demagogue. They're getting me to try to become a cult leader. They want me to start manipulating people. They want me to change how I talk and how I approach things and how I present myself so that I can start attracting more people to me in a way and I don't want to attract people to me through manipulation because I say things people like brother if you didn't attack people's religion brother if you weren't so harsh brother if you would say this or brother if you would stop doing that then you can be more people you can get more people and I'd rather like I Dr. Clark said I'd rather walk march into hell by myself than into heaven with a bunch of fools so I am not a manipulator and people don't use that word but they say Diallo we want you to become a manipulator we want you to seduce black people. I don't want black people to come to liberation through seduction. I want them to come through rational thought, clear eye and clarity. So if I got to be unpopular, then so be it. So people, even if, even if they don't want you to join a cult, they try to manipulate you into becoming a cult of personality or starting your own cult. And this is a problem. It is disruptive to the development of conscious African people and therefore disruptive to the advancement and eventual liberation. African people. We have to deal with the internal cults. And we can't just focus on what's going on, what the white man doing, what the Chinese, what the Korean beauty shop owners. We got to have internal critique. So we're going to continue this discussion on Monday. Um, man, I'm not going to have any time to play uh, Raising Black Boys. But I, I will play that. And remember, you can support and help keep the Bro Diallo show on the air. Become a Patreon. And now, if you watch Bro Diallo on YouTube, I have set up the Super Chat since last night. So you can make direct contributions when we're live on the air. Everything is, is, is uh, appreciated. I'd like to uh, give a shout out to Brother Chauncey, as always, who is a big support. I don't think I'd be here if it wasn't for... Chauncey in particular, you know, providing everything from technical to support to now he's branched out to start doing some some uh, production work for the Bro Diallo show. And so this is no longer a one man band. I got Dr. Mingo. I got Brother Chauncey. So I'm not alone in this. I got a little help, but we still need your support and resource. So you can become a Patreon. You can go to Diallo Kenyatta, make a donation. And now I'm happy to say that you can also kick in on uh, YouTube. Uh, through super chat, so you know, help a brother out, reach out. You know, if you if you do value this this independent media, I ain't about to get no corporate sponsorship. I ain't about to get no not for profit uh, foundation funding. Jay Z didn't cut me in on that four hundred thousand. He just sent out to the Better Boys Foundation and the Crushers Club. He could have you know hooked hooked me up too. I, I'm I can get you some some tax deductions too, Jay Z. Somebody asked me, would you take Jay Z's money? And I'm like, hell yeah, I'm like Biggie Smalls. Give me the loot, give me the loot. <laughs> hell yeah, I'd take Jay-Z's money. But I would not take Jay-Z's instructions. I wouldn't take orders from him. 
I take all the fiat he want to give me, but he can't tell me nothing. Yeah, I'm like, you know what? What that do you? You saying something? You can't tell me nothing. Anyway, let's 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 uh, go out on on a high note. Uh, some more dons uh, and I uh, check y'all Monday morning, and let's see if we can do a Q and A over the weekend. How about that? Cash me. Outside, how about that? Anyway, Bro Diallo Show, Q4 Radio. Shout out to the entire Q4 community. Every time I come into this Q4 studio, I'm seeing they just bigging it up, building it up. And I'm very happy to be a part of it and to contribute to this. And uh, you too, kick it in. Q4, and not just Q4 Radio, but there's an entire studio. Q4 Studio, you want to do a show, you got a band, you need studios for, for your music. You want to put out another crappy drill album, Chicago Gangster Drill album. You want to do that? Holla at John, holla at Q4 Radio and Q4 Studio, uh, Bro Diallo. And uh, like I said, y'all have a, a, a safe and productive weekend. <laughs> Brody, all the